So good to see you all in the house of the Lord. Uh, today we have a special uh, drama sermon, a demonstrative sermon, and uh, we're going we're gonna to act out the book of Esther, and, uh, and, but we're going to do it with an allegory. And, uh, you know, Jesus taught with parables. Much of his teaching was telling stories. And many of the Old Testament stories are actual historical fact, Jewish history, but they're also allegories. 1 Corinthians 10 says that the whole journey of the children of Israel, that they traveled from Egypt through the wilderness all the way to Canaan's land, it was for our example, or it was for a picture, a type, a shadow, an allegory. Remember when Abraham sent Eliezer to find a bride for Isaac? That's a historical fact, but it's also a beautiful allegory, how Abraham represented the father, Eliezer the Holy Ghost, Isaac the son, and Rebekah the bride. So uh, there's so much to learn in the Old Testament when you look through the eyes of the story. So when we tell an allegory, we're trying to introduce spiritual truths into the story uh, that are there. We're not trying to put something on top of what God meant the word to mean. We're trying to find out the author's intent. And we know God is the author of the entire Bible. We also know all scriptures given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. So uh, we are, uh, we're going to have a lot of fun with this today. You're going to be part of the story, and uh, it'll be a narrative drama. As I narrate, you'll understand your part in the, in the, in the drama. We also have um, a professional team here to film this. The reason we're doing this, we did a demonstrative message a few weeks ago. And we put it on our podcast online, and people couldn't see the demonstration, and they were confused. And uh, we're going to break open the body, soul, and spirit again, the threefold being of man. And we want people to be able to understand. So we're going to try to put this film uh, version of the sermon for our online community. Our online church is much larger than our local church. So we're actually doing this for them. So uh, it'll be fun. It'll be different. We haven't done it this way before. I've preached on this uh, story of Esther probably a half dozen times in the past 30 years but just in the past six months, the Lord started showing me this allegory where it really made sense to me, where I really came into the truth of it, and uh, it became reality in my life. So I'm very excited about it, and we'll just take off and get going. Are y'all good for a little, little show here today? Amen. <laughs> All right. The story starts out about the Persian Empire. After the days of Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon... King Xerxes ruled the known world. He ruled all the way from Ethiopia and Africa all the way to India. It was a gigantic empire. The Bible says there were 127 providences in the empire. And uh, so the story, the, uh, the way the allegory is going to work is that King Xerxes is the soul of man. I want you to think about your soul when you see King Xerxes. But the congregation here, y'all are the body. And Esther is going to be the spirit. It's a body, soul, and spirit. So, so you guys are the body. On the map, the entire empire of King Xerxes represents the body. He ruled from 486 B.C. to 465 B.C. And uh, so you're the body. You're the Persian Empire. And we'll introduce to you now our cast of characters. If I could have King Xerxes come forward. There he is right behind me, dynamite. <laughs> He represents the soul. The soul is the boss of your being. The soul is where all your choices are made. It's where your emotions are felt, where decisions are made, plans and strategies, where your vision is created. All this comes out of the soul of man. And it's the soul that sits on the throne. He's the boss of your being. He's the soul. We all have a soul. That's what's boss in your being. That's what makes you do what you do. You're the body, the kingdom, from Ethiopia to India. We also have uh, the body of sin and death, the old man. <laughs> this is Haman. Haman was a bad guy. <laughs> the body of sin and death... 
He was evil to the core. Everything about him was nasty. And uh, in Romans chapter 7, the uh, Apostle Paul said, man, what I want to do, I don't do, and what I don't want to do, that's what I do. But it's not me, it's sin that dwelleth in me. What he was saying was, you inherited this. Every human being inherited a fallen nature. The Bible gives it three terms. It calls it the old man, the flesh, and the body of sin and death. So we're going to just, for simplified reasons, just call you the old man. He's Haman. He's got a great influence on the soul. Ever since you were born into the world, Haman influences the soul. There's another character, though, called the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, he's a pure. He's as much a God as the Father and the Son. He was sent here after Jesus ascended to heaven to be our comforter, our guide, our leader, our teacher. He wants to come inside your soul. He wants to come inside the kingdom and rule and reign, give you a life of joy and peace and happiness. But the Holy Spirit in our story starts outside the palace, outside the kingdom. Haman's in the kingdom, influencing the soul, the Holy Spirit's outside. And then there's our beautiful spirit, Esther. Esther was a Jewish girl. Her mom and dad died. Bless your heart. (laughs) But her uncle Mordecai adopted her as his very own. Esther plays a real role. She's the spirit, your human spirit. When you see Esther today, think about your spirit. When you see Xerxes, think about your soul. You're the body. The Holy Spirit's on the outside trying to influence the kingdom. And that's our cast of characters. There's one character missing called Vashti. The king sent his rebellious wife away. He sent the unregenerated spirit we were born with away. There, there, there's, a, there's a shaking in our life at times when we finally come to the end of our road and we, and we don't want this evil ruling us anymore and we're ready for a change in our government. The king didn't know what he was doing, but Vashti was exiled. And so begins our story. In Esther 3, 1, it says, Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted Haman the Agite over all the other nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. He crowned him with special glory and gave him authority. He made him the boss of everyone in the kingdom. See, Xerxes had no idea of the wicked nature of Haman. Haman had the complete confidence, trust of the king, and he influenced all his decisions, all his thinking, all his actions. It's important to know something about Haman. The Bible calls him the Agite, the Jew's enemy. In Esther 3.10. You see, Haman was an Agite. That's a descendant of King Agag. King Agag was king of the Amalekites. God ordered Saul to kill all the Amalekites. The Bible says there are people whom the Lord hath indignation forever. You see, the Amalekites were descendants of Esau. And the Bible says it's written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau I've hated. So Haman was an Agite. He was wicked to the core. The spirit of Satan controlled Esau. Esau would have been his great, 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 great granddaddy. Haman is a direct descendant of Esau. Esau said, I don't need a birthright restoring me to dependence upon God. I am independent. I am self-sufficient. I will be what I am. God can do nothing with a man that has the spirit of Esau. Nothing with a man that will not admit he needs anything from God. So remember this. As Satan hated God, so Cain hated Abel. And as Ishmael hated Isaac, and Esau hated Jacob, and Amalek hated Israel, so Haman hated the Jews. Now you see the story as it's set. Over to our right, you see Esther and Mordecai. You need to understand, Mordecai was a Jew. He came from the exile of, of Nebuchadnezzar when they carried him away into captivity. Mordecai had a very beautiful, lovely young cousin 
who was also called Esther in the Persian tongue. With her father and her mother dead, Mordecai adopted Esther into his own family and raised her as his very own child. You see, Esther's dress has turned from black to white because once she got adopted into the family, that's a picture of how we get saved. See, none of us are born into the royal lineage of God. We're born alien from God, strangers from God. He has to adopt us into his family. We're we're born with humanity, and he adopts us into a family of divinity. We're born in a temporal world, and that adoption brings us into an eternal world. The adoption process should never be taken lightly by by the Christian. Romans 6, forgive me, Romans 8, 14, and 15, For as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Galatians 5, I mean 4, verse 5, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law, so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you're no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you're his child, God has made you his heir. Do you see how powerful it is when you realize you've been adopted into God's family and you're an heir of all the treasures of God, the power, the glory, the kingdom of God. You're a son and a daughter, not based on anything you did, but based on what Jesus did at the cross of Calvary. He came to purchase that right to adopt you. So Esther now has a white robe on. The Holy Spirit has adopted her as his very own. That's a picture of someone getting saved, and now you're you're part of the family of God. You see, when we get saved, we receive the Holy Spirit. Look at Galatians 3, that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, we teach the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but that's a separate experience. That's a, that's a latter experience after salvation. When you get adopted into God's family, you receive the Spirit of God right into your spirit. So the Holy Spirit, Mordecai, his spirit is now into Esther, just like when someone gets born again. The Bible says in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You know it just because your spirit tells you. It gives you a confirmation. Yeah, God's in me and I'm in him. I'm part of his family by the adoption process. I have the Spirit of God living in me. How many could just say amen if that's true in your life today? That's beautiful. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 10, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, the testimony in your very own spirit. So the same spirit that Mordecai has, he comes into Esther, he regenerates her, gives her a born-again experience. So the same faith that saves us is the same faith that allows us to receive the Spirit of God in our heart. We're regenerated and we're sealed. Look at these two scriptures, please. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. See, we were dead inside and he made us alive. Well, we we were a darkened spirit and he turned it into light. There was a supernatural born again experience when you received Christ into your heart called regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus our Lord. And Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom also you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit. So not only has he entered into Esther, but his spirit is sealed into her, and Esther is now in right relationship with God. That's a picture of the Christian. Many Christians have the spirit in them, But their unregenerated, unsanctified soul still sits on the throne. Even after all that good born again experience I was just talking about. Y'all getting the picture? (laughs) Amen. 
The Holy Spirit continued to care for and guide Esther. Esther, uh, the, the, the decree went out that the king was looking for a new bride. So they rounded up all the beautiful young virgins of the kingdom and brought them into his palace. And Esther got chosen to be one of those. They uh, put eunuchs over the girls to, to help them get ready for the king. And Esther went through a year-long process of perfumes and oils and just being as beautiful as she can preparing for the king. The Bible says in Esther chapter 2 verse 10, Esther had not told anyone of her nationality and family background because Mordecai had directed her not to do so. Every day Mordecai would take a walk near the courtyard of the harem to find out about Esther and what was happening to her. So Mordecai is going to walk up to the palace and he's going to check on her every day. He, he, he continued this influence in her life. Mordecai is going to walk up, there we go, to the palace and uh, <laughs> just kind of check on her, look in the window, ask how she's doing. <laughs> and uh, now look at this picture. Esther, the born again spirit, is now in the palace. She, she's, she's part of the palace but the Holy Spirit is still outside the palace. The only influence he has on the kingdom is through the Spirit or Esther. Now this is much like millions of Christians all over the world today. They've actually had a born again experience. Esther's in the palace but the Holy Spirit's still influencing from the outside and the soul has not even been influenced at all. See, if you can see the picture, I challenge you today to ask yourself, where am I in my journey with God? Have I been saved, but am I still just part of the harem? Is the Holy Spirit still outside of the palace? Is Xerxes still ruling and reigning the kingdom? Esther, after a year, the king chose her above all the other girls. She won his favor. She was the most beautiful of them all. And the Bible says the king loved Esther above all the women. She obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her the queen instead of Vashti. Now at this point in the journey, for the first time, she's going to have a great influence on the soul. Esther, again, represents your regenerated, born-again spirit. The Holy Spirit now has made it. She's come into the kingdom. The Holy Spirit, Mordecai, Stephen, has come into the kingdom through Esther. And now Esther is going to sit at the king's side and begin to influence him. See, if you want more of Jesus, if you want more reality of the Word in your life, yield your spirit to the Holy Spirit. Yield to His instructions. He'll show you how to get to the soul where now Esther can whisper in the king's ear and have an influence on the whole kingdom. Mordecai is still outside the kingdom, but Esther is now on the throne. The Bible said in Esther 2.20, Esther continued to keep her family background and nationality a secret. See, you don't have to tell everything you know all the time, okay? She was still following Mordecai's directions, just as she did when she lived in his home. Now, here's a key. If you want to experience the fullness of God, it's all about obeying, just trusting and obeying the Holy Spirit. He's going to continually give you direction. And even though she was now the queen, the second most powerful person in the kingdom, she was still obeying Mordecai not the king. You understand the difference? A saved, born-again believer only has to trust and obey, and God does the rest. Now, neither Esther nor the king were aware of how wicked Haman really, really was. You got to understand Haman is still in the picture. Esther's not even aware Haman's in power. The king's not aware of Haman's nature. You following that? The Bible says all the king's officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by, for so the king had commanded. (laughs) 
But Mordecai refused to bow down or show him respect. Mordecai would just stare him in the eye and it made Haman furious. You know what you need to learn to do as a Christian? To bow to God, but never bow to the flesh. Never bow to the old man. Never bow to the influence of Satan. You need to learn to look him in the eye like Stephen looked those Pharisees in the eye when they stoned him to death. You need to learn to look him in the eye like Jesus looked Pilate and Herod in the eye when they accused him falsely. Never bow to the enemy. You should defy the spirit of the enemy at all costs at all times. Don't ever negotiate with him. He's the enemy. Mordecai was the only one in the kingdom that wouldn't bow to Haman. The Bible says when Haman saw Mordecai would not bow down to him or show him respect, he was filled with rage. (laughs) He was furious. He was angry. He could not understand why that one man would not bow down to him. The Bible says in Galatians 5, 17, the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Stare him down, Stephen. These are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. You see, this is the battle of every Christian. The flesh versus the spirit. Haman versus Mordecai. This struggle is going on right now in the heart of every believer whether they realize it or not. Romans 8, 5 through 8 says, to be carnally minded or Haman minded is death. But to be spiritually minded or Mordecai minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Haman had this tremendous influence still on the king. He had the king's ear. He had the king's attention. I'll read with you and from Esther 3, verse 6. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality, which meant he learned that Mordecai was a Jew. So he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the empire of Xerxes. Haman approached the king Xerxes and said, there's a certain race of people scattered throughout all the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. Their laws are different from those of any other people, and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So it is not in the king's interest to let them live. If it please the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed, and I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the government administrators to be deposited in the royal treasury. Haman hated Mordecai, and he hated the Jews. And he hated the Jews' law, and he hated the Jews' God. He was an ancient version of Hitler, extreme hatred and wickedness toward God and God's people. The scary thing is that the nature of Haman lives in many, many Christian hearts all around the world today and is a gigantic influence still on their soul. Even Christians that have been born again and have a regenerated spirit sitting right in the middle of their being, they've got Haman still alive and still influencing the soul. And Xerxes was not even aware of how wicked Haman was. The soul is sold out to the old man. Even with Esther as his queen, The Bible said in Esther 3.10, the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the Agite, the Jew's enemy. He has the ring of authority like Pharaoh gave it to Joseph. That means he put Joseph over the whole kingdom of Egypt. What Xerxes did was even a much larger kingdom because he just gave Haman 
the authority over the entire kingdom from Ethiopia to India. The, the entire Persian empire, now Haman was the boss. Haman was determined to destroy the Jews. So he sent letters out throughout the entire kingdom with a decree to destroy all of the Jews. Can we have some help with the letters? Can we have some messengers, some deacons maybe, or anybody jump up? We don't have a letter for everybody, but we got 30, 40 letters. The decree, you can read it here. The official decree from the king. All Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on March the 7th. The property of the Jews will be given to those who kill them. Can you imagine if you're a Jew and that a decree like that goes throughout the kingdom? The Bible says in 315, at the king's command, the decree went out by swift messengers, and it also proclaimed in the fortress of Susha. Then the king and Haman sat down to drink, <laughs> just to have a glass of wine. But the city of Susha fell into total confusion. King James says they were perplexed. They were afraid. This is the devil's work to put fear on his people. The king had no idea what Haman had just done in his name. But the decree went out to destroy God's special race of people, the Jews. The Bible says in Esther 4.1, when Mordecai, the Holy Spirit, learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes put on burlap and ashes, and went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. And as the news of the decree went out into the providences, there was great mourning and wailing the people fasted and wept and wailed, and many of the people lay in burlap and ashes. <laughs> okay, okay. Very good, very good. You get an A+. <laughs> You see, even though a person may have a born-again spirit, their soul might be so sold out to the influence of Satan through their old man that, that it puts death into their whole body and into their whole life. That's a picture of the Holy Spirit being grieved. But at this point, Esther heard what was happening, and she was curious to find out what was going on. So she had one of her eunuchs, the king's eunuchs, administered to her, I'll pick this up in chapter 4, verse 5. Esther sent for Hatach, one of the king's eunuchs. That's the best eunuch we could find. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Who had been appointed as her attendant. <laughs> she ordered him to go to Mordecai and find out what was troubling him and why he was in mourning. So Hatach went out to Mordecai in the square in front of the palace gate. Mordecai told him the whole story, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai gave Hatach a copy of the decree issued in Susha that called for the death of all Jews. He asked Hatach to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. He also asked Hatach to direct her to go to the king to beg for mercy and to plead for her people. So Hatach returned to Esther with Mordecai's message. Then Esther told Hatach to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. All the king's officials, even the people in the provinces, know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his golden scepter. And the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days. So Hatach gave Esther's message to Mordecai. As they go back and forth, I want you to understand, this is a picture of the Holy Spirit convicting the human spirit. She had no idea of the wickedness of Haman. She had no idea what Satan's influence was in the kingdom. 
But the Holy Spirit started sending her messages and communicating reality and what was going on. Now see, there's a difference, beloved, in knowing what is consequentially right and wrong and what is absolutely morally right and wrong. A parent, a teacher, a pet owner, we all are involved in consequential behavior. We reward our dogs when they just sit and look at us a certain way. And if they were to steal the food off the table, we would spank them. Now, can you imagine how confusing a dog's life is? There's a piece of meat on the table. I'm a hungry dog. Why do I get a spanking when I eat the meat? (laughs) And why do I get rewarded if I sit down and do like this? But a dog learns consequential behavior, positive and negatives. Smack wrong, treat right. And uh, a child learns that. And that's why so many children, when they leave their homes in the, at 17, 18 years old, and they've been obedient for so long, and they go to university, they, they, they jump over the fence and start acting crazy. And, and if you're not careful, your church can do that. Your religious leader can just put these rules on you that are consequential. And you, you, you get rewarded or punished, so you live within these rules. See, that's not the conviction of God. The Holy Spirit, it's His job to come inside your spirit and convict you of what is absolutely morally right and wrong. And this will go on the rest of your Christian life. You need to stop saying, what does Pastor Bill want me to do? What does the church want me to do? What do my parents want me to do? And start praying, sweet Holy Spirit like Esther did. Give me the information. I need to know what's really going on in my life. Convict me of sin. So as the information was passed back and forth between Esther and Mordecai, Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. It was not Esther's responsibility to kill Haman, for that was Mordecai's job. It was her responsibility to simply obey instructions, even if it meant her death. She had told Mordecai, if I go to the king, I'll die. Mordecai said, you've got to go to the king. It was her job just to trust the Holy Spirit and obey instructions. See, we must die to our own ability to crucify our old man or our flesh, the body of sin and death. We cannot, no matter how hard you try, you cannot. That is God's business. God has a plan and a way to crucify your old man. We just have to trust Him. The Bible says in Matthew 16, 25, whosoever will save his life will lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Those are the words of Jesus. In Esther 4, 15, Esther bade them return to Mordecai. One last message from her eunuch. Please give him this answer. Go gather all the Jews that are present in Sushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink three days or nights. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. So I will go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther had made a choice to obey the Holy Spirit. And all she asked was that everyone fast and pray for three days and three nights. That's a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ for three days and three nights. His body was in the grave and his soul went to hell. But at the end of the three days and three nights, the Father raised him from the dead. Esther now was dead to her self-interest, dead to her self-life. She was totally going to depend upon Mordecai and make the choice to obey. If I perish, I perish. You got, if you find your life, you'll lose it. If you lose your life, you'll find it. Esther made the choice, and the city fasted, and everybody fasted for three days and three nights. Like the Jonah was in the well of the belly for three days and three nights. There was this period of utter death and hopelessness. But the Bible said on the third day of the fast that Esther put on her royal robe. 
and entered into the inner court of the palace, just across from the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne facing the entrance. And when he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her and held out the golden scepter to her. Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter. Then the king asked her, what do you want, my queen Esther? What is your request? I'll give it to you up to half of my kingdom. God just raised Esther from the dead. She thought she was going to walk in there and be put to death. And when he raised the scepter out, it was a picture of God bringing her out of death unto life. If you'll just trust the Holy Spirit, you may think you're going to die, but beloved, he's trying to bring you back to life. She had no more issues to face, only instructions to obey. Esther sits at the throne and makes a request unto the king's ear. She had his full attention. Her beauty was unsurpassed. She had won his heart. And now her influence was growing tremendously. In Esther 5, verse 4, Esther replied, If it please the king, let the king and Haman come to a banquet, for I have prepared for the king. The king turned to his attendants and said, Tell Haman to come quickly to a banquet, as Esther hath requested. So the king and Haman went to Esther's banquet. And while they were drinking wine, the king said to Esther, tell me what you really want. What is your request? And I will give it to you, even up to half of my kingdom. Esther replied, this is my request and deepest wish. If I have found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request to do what I ask, please come with Haman tomorrow to the banquet. I will prepare for you. Then I will explain everything may have seemed strange. Why didn't she just tell him right then? See, God still had more work to do. God has a plan and a purpose. You may not understand what he's telling you today. It's your job to trust him, to obey him, just keep following instructions because God has a plan. Now, at the banquet, when, after the banquet, in Esther 5 verse 9, it says, Haman left a very happy man. He was so happy. But when he saw Mordecai sitting at the palace gate, not standing up or trembling nervously before him, Mordecai just continued to defy Haman. Haman became furious again. However, he restrained himself and went home. Haman gathered together with his friends and his wife and boasted to them about his great wealth and his many children. He bragged about the honors the king had given him and how he had been promoted over all the other nobles of the officials. He's bragging. He's boasting. The flesh always wants the glory. He's always obnoxious. Then Haman added, and that's not all. Queen Esther invited only me and the king himself to the banquet. She prepared for us. And she's invited me to dine with her and the king again tomorrow. You know, the flesh can never be satisfied. The Bible says in 5.13, but then he added, this is all worth nothing as long as I see Mordecai the Jew just sitting here at the palace gate. See, you can have everything going right with your life and have one little person not treating you right and it can make you miserable. You can have 99.9% of everything going perfect and have one little thing in your life and you're absolutely miserable because the flesh can never be satisfied. Does that make sense to you? He said to Zeresh, his wife, as he goes home, and to all his friends, they said, let's a gallows be made of 50 cubits high. And tomorrow speak unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon, and then go in merrily unto the king into the banquet. This thing pleased Haman greatly, and he caused the gallows to be made. Haman intentionally, purposefully is trying to find a way to destroy God out of your life. He's always working to discourage you, always working. The Bible says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, he plotted and planned how he could get this Mordecai feller 
out of his life once and for all. He was happy as a lark. He had the king's total influence. He even now thought Esther loved him. So he was going to use his power and destroy Mordecai and then destroy all the Jews in the kingdom. But that night, that night the king was sitting on his, in his bed and he awakened and went to his throne room. And as he, because he had trouble sleeping, he ate some pizza right before bed and had a little gas. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, he ordered an attendant. I need my eunuch. Bring, bring the book. He ordered an attendant to bring the book of history of his reign so it could be read to him. In those records, he discovered an account of how Mordecai had exposed the plot of two other eunuchs who were guarding the door of the king's private quarters. They had plotted to assassinate King Xerxes. And Xerxes is reading this, he says, what reward or recognition did we ever give Mordecai for this? The king asked. His attendants reply, nothing has been done for him. Now this is a picture of an awakening. We have these times in our life, maybe we're reading our Bible, reading a book, hearing a sermon, and we get an awakening. And we realize We've not done something to honor Mordecai. Again, Mordecai is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Look how many things he's done for you in your life that you never stopped to honor him for, that you never stopped to give him gratitude for. This was a spiritual awakening. Thank you, my eunuch. God bless you. (laughs) The king realized he had not given Mordecai the honor, the glory, or the recognition for his life. Now, the soul still not yet aware of how wicked Haman is. The Bible says in Esther 6, 3, the king said, who's in the court? Now Haman was coming to the outer court of the king's house to speak into the king, talking, he's, he's just coming to tell the king he wants to hang Mordecai in the gallows that he had prepared for him. So the king's servant said, behold, Haman's in the court. And the king said, let him come on in. Now the flesh always wants the glory. Listen to this exchange in Esther 6, 6 through 10. King said, what should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? He's asking Haman this question. Haman thought to himself, whom would the king wish to honor more than me? I am his main guy. He replied, if the king wishes to honor someone, he should bring out one of the king's own royal robes as well as a horse that the king himself has ridden, one with the royal emblem on it. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let him see that the man whom the king wishes to honor is dressed in the king's robes and led through the city square on the king's horse. Have the officials shout as they go, this is what the king does for someone he wishes to honor. Excellent, says king to Haman. (laughs) Quick. Take the robes and my horse and do just as you said for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the gate. <laughs> Haman had to go pale. He, had, he couldn't believe the turn of events. He thought he was going to get honored and instead <laughs> Mordecai was going to get honored. So Haman had to put the crown on Mordecai's head and he had to put the robe on Mordecai's back, and he gave Mordecai the king's horse, the royal steed. (laughs) And he had to lead him through the city, saying, this is what King Xerxes does for the man whom he wants to honor. Now let me tell you how hard this really is. I want you to think a minute. Mordecai is the Holy Spirit that represents God. Haman represents the body of sin and death, the most wicked thing in the human being. The flesh will do anything to keep its head out of a noose. The flesh will go to church. It will preach a Sunday school class. It will preach a sermon. It will go to the mission field. It will sing. It will shout. It will give offerings. It will work at the hot dog stand. Anything, but don't put my head in a noose. You see, look at the picture. It was the flesh honoring Mordecai. This should get your attention. Is this really me lifting up Jesus because he gets all the glory? 
or am I just trying to survive? Am I just dodging and ducking and trying to be religious, trying my best to survive? This was the worst day of Haman's life to have to take his bitter enemy that had defied him through the city streets as he rode on the royal steed. (laughs) Wow. The old man always wants the glory. The old man will do anything to survive. Haman goes home dejected and humiliated. Mordecai returns to the palace gate. And then just a short time, Haman was summoned to the banquet that Esther had prepared for the king. Haman's emotions now must have done a 180. He was so elated that the king and the queen loved him. And then he just had to experience giving Mordecai honor whom he was going to ask the king to kill. The moment of truth had arrived at the banquet. There's moments of truth in your body, soul, and spirit in your journey. These moments of truth, these decisive times that will change the course of your entire life. The moment of truth that had arrived for Esther. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet on the second occasion while they were drinking wine. The king said to Esther, tell me what you want, Queen Esther. What is your request? I will give it to you, even up to half of the kingdom. From this moment on, there could be no going back for Esther. The flesh revealed. This is our story of how the King Xerxes finally saw that he had a Haman living in his heart. This is my prayer for everyone at return, that we can all see, get get it revealed so we can get the right man in the gallows and 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 then the correct man in the management of our kingdom. Esther 7.3, Queen Esther replied, if I have found favor with the king, if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of the people be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we had merely been sold as slaves, I would remain quiet, for that would be too trivial a matter to warrant the disturbing the king. The king said, who would do such a thing? King Xerxes demanded. (laughs) Who would be so presumptuous as to touch my bride? Esther replied, This wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. The king grew pale with fright before the king and queen. Haman grew pale. The king jumped to his feet in rage and went into the outer palace garden. Haman, however, stayed behind to plead for his life with Queen Esther, for he knew that the king intended to kill him. A choice had to be made. The Holy Spirit has now influenced the soul of Xerxes through the born-again regenerated spirit. And there's a war and a conflict within the palace. Just take a moment with me and go to Romans 7 in your mind. The Apostle Paul, the greatest Bible teacher of them all, had this same struggle going within He said these words, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I that do it, but it's sin that dwells within me. He said, this isn't me. This is Haman in me. I was born with this. So I find to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging against the war. Waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So as the apostle had this struggle, as King Xerxes now realizes he has a struggle, Haman has finally been revealed. He sees Esther as a total great influence in his life. 
He's struggling to make a choice. And right here, he understands that the old man has to die. In despair, Haman falls on the couch where Queen Esther was reclining, just as the king was returning from the palace garden. The king explained, will he even assault the queen right here in the palace before my very eyes? And as soon as the king spoke, his attendants covered Haman's face. signaling his doom. Behold also the gallows 50 cubits high which Haman had made for Mordecai. Then the king said, hang him there. So they hanged Haman on the gallows and the king's wrath was pacified. The bottom line, you don't educate the flesh, pamper the flesh, negotiate with the flesh, try to improve upon the flesh, try to make the flesh religious. Beloved one, as hard as it may be, the flesh has to die. If you're willing to identify with what Jesus did at the cross, this thing can be put to death. Jesus came to destroy the very power of the body of sin and death, and He crucified it at the cross. The king made a great choice to kill Haman. You see, it's simply a matter of identifying with what Jesus did at the cross for us. He crucified our flesh, our old man, or our body of sin and death at the cross 2,000 years ago. Now we need to learn to walk in faith, walk in the light, dead to self, alive unto God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is one of my favorite scriptures. It says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin made him, Jesus, to be sin, made Jesus to be our sin. Who knew, he that was righteous, Jesus never sinned, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ, but nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Uh, at this point in the kingdom, the wrong man is finally out of the throne and the preparation has now been made to get the right man in the throne. Romans 6, 6 says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Again, you don't have the power to crucify your own flesh. If we did, Jesus would not have had to go to the cross to do it for us. The stage is now set for a radical change of government, which will produce a radical change of behavior. The king's back on his throne. On the same day, Xerxes gave the property of Haman to the queen. Then Mordecai was brought before the king. Do you realize this is the first time Mordecai is now inside the palace? The king's influenced by his born again spirit, but now the Holy Ghost that Haman is gone, the Holy Ghost is invited close to the soul. The Mordecai was brought before the king, for Esther had told the king how they were related. The king took off his signet ring, which he had taken back from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. Esther appointed Mordecai to be in charge of all of Haman's property. This is a picture of a still an unsanctified, unregenerated soul, but now greatly influenced by the Spirit and by the Holy Ghost, so much so that he gave the Holy Spirit the power and the authority to manage the whole kingdom. Now you're getting to a place of joy, of peace, of love, of victory. This is Christianity. There's a new prime minister in town. This is what the Bible calls the fullness of the Holy Ghost. The sole king, now in total harmony with the desires of the Holy Spirit, Mordecai, within a yielded, born-again human spirit, Esther. This is what the Bible describes as the fullness of the Holy Spirit. This is where true love, joy, and peace can be realized. Do you want to love everybody, but you just don't have the love in you? This is the key to getting it in you. Put the old man on the cross with Jesus, and then allow the Holy Spirit to come in and actually be the very boss or the governor of your life. 
Yeah, your soul's still in need of transformation. Xerxes not yet been totally changed. But yielding to the Holy Spirit and allowing him to manage the kingdom. There's a new government in town. The Bible says Mordecai left the king's presence wearing the royal robe of blue and white and the great crown of gold and an outer cloak of fine linen and purple. And then the people of Susha celebrated because Mordecai had sent out a new decree throughout all the kingdom that the Jews would not be annihilated but they would be preserved and they could fight for their rights and their property and it brought joy and gladness to the kingdom. There was joy and gladness everywhere. People were happy. People were shouting. They were really happy, man. This is great news. They weren't going to (laughs) die. Haman's in the gallows. Mordecai's in the palace. Everything in the kingdom has changed. Now the people filled with joy and gladness. Esther, however, though, knew. She knew the work was not yet quite done. There was great change throughout all the kingdom, but Haman had ten sons. So she whispered in the king's ear, If it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Sushan to do tomorrow, also according to the day's decree, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. And the king commanded it, so it to be done. And the decree was given in Sushan. They hanged Haman's ten sons. Just because you make in these great choice, the best choice of your life, reckon yourself dead, be alive unto God, realize that Haman's influence had gone deep into the kingdom. And he had ten sons that would have tried to knock Mordecai off the throne unless they be put to death. So they killed again. You have to see the picture you, if you're just, let's just be nice to these boys. Maybe they won't rebel. You know, I can just kind of hang on to the stuff inside of me that's still not sanctified. No, God wants you to kill Haman and all of his sons and his grandsons. You've got to go to the cross and let that be identified with Christ Jesus to put him to death. You see, Romans six eleven requires not one act of faith, but an attitude of faith. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead unto sin. That's half of it. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. To reckon yourself dead requires more than one act of faith. It requires an attitude of faith. Continually reckoning yourself dead to sin. Continually reckoning yourself alive in Jesus Christ. And then abiding in Christ, staying in Christ, living out of the identity that Jesus purchased for you, utterly dependent upon Him. It's an attitude of faith. Mordecai is back in the kingdom. One thing really important as we close I want you to understand is that Mordecai had the ring. He was the boss under Xerxes. Now think of this. Esther's a born again, regenerated human spirit that's now sealed and filled with the Holy Spirit. Perfect relationship with God. Mordecai is the Holy Spirit living inside of you governing your life. The soul still not yet 100% sanctified. This is going to take the rest of his life to get sanctified. People want to be perfect overnight. It's not going to happen. I mean, he, the Bible says you got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. John 17, Jesus says, sanctify them with thy truth. You're going to need to read your Bible and pray because the soul has all these habits and memory. I got 55 years of bad images and bad things I've taken in. It's going to take a long time to get that fixed. You got that? But who, who did God leave in charge? Xerxes, the soul. See, he has veto power. Anytime you want to, you can veto what the Holy Ghost does in your life. The Bible said Mordecai the Jew became the prime minister. He was the boss with authority next to the king Xerxes himself. So he was great among the Jews and held in high esteem, but he was next to Xerxes. Now what this is showing, beloved, is that we all still have the power to choose In order to love God and to reciprocate His love back to Him, we have to make these choices. And when you choose to please Him, choose to obey Him, choose to serve Him, choose to praise Him, choose to love Him, it brings Him such pleasure. If He took your choice away, 
you would just be a puppet on a string and you could never please God. He has to, the power to veto is great, but boy, it's a big responsibility. Sometimes I wish, God, you just do it all. You know, I'll just show up every day. But no, I, I've got the, the power to choose. And it's these choices you make morning, noon, and night, 24-7, whether you're going to please yourself or you're going to please him. And you're created to please him. The reason you're on this earth is to bring him pleasure. So it's real important to understand, even though the kingdom is now set, Xerxes still has veto power. That means you still have the power to choose any way you want. I'm concluding. Christianity is all about the exchange life. Haman for Mordecai. Self for the flesh, the old man, the body of sin and death for Jesus Christ. Christianity is a life of substituting our wickedness with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If we have the choice of who's going to manage our life, it will either be Satan or Jesus. There's no other influence. It's either truth or error, light or darkness. We choose daily who's going to govern or boss our life. When we say, if I perish, I perish, we're putting our complete trust in him and leaving the results or the consequences up to him. All Christians have a choice to make. Whether they continue to let their flesh rule or by faith identify with what Jesus did for you at the cross and reckon yourself dead, crucified with him, then alive unto God. Raised with Jesus Christ, walking in newness of life. This is walking by faith, walking in the spirit, or walking in the light. Living out of my new identity in Christ with the yielded spirit being managed by the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus Christ living his life through me. This is Christianity. There's a little letter here, a recording, a guy named Graham Cook recorded, just a minute or two, called A Letter from God. I want you to listen to this. Let's just sit tight. Letter from God by Graham Cook. In my eyes, your old life has already met its demise and it's finished. The cross has set you free from your old man, a sin nature, and a selfish lifestyle. When I died, so did you. I did not just die for you, I died as you. When I was buried, I took your old man with me, and when I was raised from the dead, I left your old man behind. He cannot ever be resurrected. It is gone, finished, forever. You died in me, then a new version of you was raised from the dead through my glorious workings. Now you and I are walking together in a completely new and totally different life. Your old self was crucified with me so that everything connected to that life could never make it past the grave. We are united together always, and no one and nothing can ever separate us. Beloved, I am so excited that we are together as resurrected beings. All the old has passed away, and you are my new creation in Jesus. I give you the beautiful, always amazing Holy Spirit to empower and support all your learning as you experience my life in you. You are no longer a slave to sin. It is no longer your nature. I have removed it. All that remains is your attachment through memory to a habit, which can be broken by our partnership and relationship. He who is dead is entirely free, and I will teach you and show you the reality and the power of that freedom.